Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House. You're with a unitive, Charles Google. Unitive. Bringing people together. Yeah. Building bridges. Ending dissension. Oh, I, I, like, I think I like this one a lot. Yeah. Just, you know... Getting past differences and, and division, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just, just bringing everybody together, and 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 like, no more, no more fights between generations and and religions and nations and and and, and, and different social classes. Just everyone coming together. Yeah, that's great. Come on, people now. Smile on your brother. Everybody get it together. Try to love one another right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, oh, this is great. I, I feel so good. You know, I, speaking as a force for unity, I feel that it's so important that all of us just pull together. You know what I'm saying? We're all in this together. Everybody, I mean, it's just wonderful. Sometimes I think to myself, self, I think, I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. I'd like to hold it in my hand and sing sweet harmony. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just, yeah, it, it, it's wonderful. Don't you feel the ocean of unity that just brings us all together? That's what we love about you, Charles, that beautiful mix of idealism with corporate messaging. <laughs> well, that's why we pay you the big bucks. <laughs> that's right. That's why that's that's why your your great uncle used to keep me around. <laughs> you know, you know, kid, I'm gonna go for a meeting with uh Don Giorgio Maracana. I want you to come along. And I said, Don, Don Giovanni, why why do you want me to come along? You've got this you know, unitive thing going with you, you know. <laughs> I got a feeling that if you just st sit there, you don't have to say anything, that somehow <laughs> you'll be able to bring the, the sides together. <laughs> and he had that kind of confidence in me. And I think he was right. I mean, you know, there's there's a reason why the West Side and East Side didn't break into into war so long as Giovanni lived, and I I, you know, I feel that I had a part in dealing with that because people who know me know that I'm all about others. I'm all about bringing people together, yeah. building bridges of understanding, and that's who I am. I mean, my whole my whole story is about creating understanding because you know at the end of the day i think everyone's really saying the same thing you know what i mean we yeah. all want the same things and i just feel that there's so much division today you know and and, and I, I i just i think that anyone who's in favor of division should be lined up against the wall and shot <laughs> Uh, because obviously they're bad. <laughs> okay. That, that was a quick... What? I made a quick left turn. <laughs> just... Well, no, I mean, I was, I was just thinking of something uh, your great uncle always said to me, which was how Al Capone could bring people together, oh. especially on St. Valentine's Day. That all makes sense now. <laughs> yeah, see, wow. they went out with a heart and a smile. <laughs> and when St. Valentine's Day was done that year, unity was restored to the outfit in Chicago. Yeah. Because there had been dissension before. 
Yeah, but when I... old Scarface was done, unity was restored. Yeah, you can you can get more with a kind word and a gun than just a kind word. This is true, or just a gun. <laughs> Although, if you have to choose. So no, I, I uh, yeah, you know, you you were you were just you were just a little one uh, when he passed, but I I still remember him patting you on the head and saying, "This is the future." Then he kind of rolled his eyes. But I, I think he meant it in a nice way. Yes, I'm sure of it. And then he said, "Keep an eye on the on the, my boys, won't you?" And I said, "I I, I will I will not, Giovanni. And whatever you do, whatever you do." I said, "Yes, yes. Don't let them anywhere near the silver." He told me to keep an eye on you two. What? Okay, whatever. It was very touching. I'm sure. And I'll I'll never forget Ty, when Tyrone's dad came to pay his last respects. You know, you well, I guess you could barely remember. It's a long time ago for you. It seems like yesterday for me. But all that week, everybody came to say goodbye to the Don. And I remember Tyrone's dad coming, and he said. There'll always be a place for your boy in the organization. Never forget that. A dear old officer Clancy came to pay his respects. Oh, it was a touching scene. None of us knew precisely when he'd leave us, of course. So, you know, we, we had the we had the Learjet on, on standby. Yeah. Yes. That's but we important. didn't know when we, when he was gonna leave. What? Oh. Oh, I see. All right. Well, what I meant to say, what I, what, uh, yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah. So what's new, Charles? What's new with you? What's new with me? Well, I will have you know that as part of my attempt to retreat ever further from the present into the welcoming past, uh, I have seen, I have uh, binge watched, binge watched a, uh, an Australian murder mystery series called, uh, what's it called? The Miss Fisher Mysteries, which, uh, it's a little, I really can't recommend them. Is that the 1920s uh, one? Yep. Uh, we watched that. I thought she's like a flapper and stuff or something. Yeah, like she, that. Is. she is. <laughs> My mom didn't like that one because she's. It's a little too yeah, I know why. It's, uh, yeah, it's a little too. <laughs> That's why I can't recommend it. Okay. But it is funny, and uh, you know, it, it's it's Australia uh, in those days. It's 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 a funny thing to think that back then the far flung British Empire really felt like one thing. You know, going from Melbourne to London was like going from San Francisco to New York. You know, it's it just a, it's, it's a weird feeling. Uh, I mean, similarly, we've spoken before about the Canadian press lords, but it was a weird thing because people went out from England to Canada, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand to live to the far reaches of the empire. But people from those places who wanted to make it big went to London. And, and so you had this weird interplay uh, the only uh, the only similar deal in American history was New York. You know, people came to New York from all over the country, but New Yorkers fanned out all over the country. That's not the case. So, so that's not the case with L.A. What what the the case people, with L.A. People come from all over the country to try to be a big star. They used to, but now more people leave than come. What? Because, in the immortal words, to, to paraphrase uh, Sid uh, Hitchens in uh, Hutch, uh, yeah, Sid LA Hutchins. Confidential. In LA Confidential, how can there be organized crime in a city with the finest city government in the world? 
Fair and, uh, we, yeah, yeah, Mayor Garcetti and the Goon Squad. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, in the ranks of the brain dead leadership of the world, Garcetti really is up there, isn't he? We the thing that the thing that really captures my attention these days, you know, that Britain, Spain, and uh so or not Britain, England specifically, Spain and uh Czechia are dumping all restrictions. No more masks, no more nothing. Okay. Great. I mean, what? Yeah. Yeah, okay. they're just dumping them. Meanwhile, in places like, oh, I don't know, Austria and Los Angeles, they're tightening the screws. But what's happening, you know, Omicron is easier to catch yeah. and much less lethal. Yeah. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, variant will be easier yet to catch and more lethal yet. You saw my Twitter about it, did you? Did you? Or didn't you? Uh, I didn't see it. No, I, I'm kind of. You know, I don't use Twitter much anymore, honestly. But yeah, it's pro- probably wise for your mental health. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, what I said was, there is a there is yet another COVID variant, Omega. It is particularly insidious because while impossible to prevent getting it, no mask or vaccine stops it. Its presence is disguised by a complete lack of any symptoms whatsoever so that none of its victims are aware of having it. <laughs> and, uh, if you remember Brother Eccles, on, uh, the, the Englishman on, uh, on Twitter, he says his response to that was, you still need to self-isolate to avoid making your family and friends feel totally healthy. <laughs> <laughs> that's good so I, I don't know how much longer the narrative is going to keep going but here in Austria it's very frustrating because the the rats jumping on a sinking ship that's really stupid but if there's nothing else the last two years have proved it's that our current leadership are the stupidest people alive it's like soup right yep as my old father said, scum rises to the top. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, as a rule, ladies and gentlemen, you don't taste just the very top of the boiling soup. <laughs> mm, straight grease. <laughs> yum, yum. <laughs> but in other news, and there's always other news, uh, there is a, 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 a cure, an utter and complete and absolute cure for COVID. Okay. Yes. Well, it requires a cessation of certain bodily functions, including breathing. But... Death is the only cure? Well, it's the only certain cure. Okay. It's the only thing we know for sure. Everything else is only partial. Got it. Oh, but it, but at the same time, death cures a lot of other ailments as well. Okay, this suddenly got really dark. All right, well, fine. Let's move along. You don't like darkness, then I'm going to switch it completely on you. And you know what I'm going to bring up? What? You know what I'm going to bring up? We discussed it in the pre-show. Whoa, oh, the, the crickets. Yes, we're going to bring up crickets. Specifically... I'm going to bring up your favorite cricket. I mean, Jiminy Cricket? I... Of course. Okay. You know, in this dark time, and again, I'm speaking as a person who's a force for unity, Jiminy Cricket had a message for all of us. And I think we need to revisit what he said. You see, this is a message that I think it's lost in the uh, hustle and bustle of life today. So here it is. Listen closely, ladies and gentlemen. I mean this for all you and me and all of us as a basis in which we can all come together. When you wish upon a star, 
makes no difference who you are. <laughs> Anything your heart desires will come to you. If your heart is in your dream, no request is too extreme. When you wish upon a star, as dreamers do, fate is kind. She brings to those who love the sweet fulfillment of their secret longing. Like a bolt out of the blue, fate steps in and sees you through. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. That's what do you think of that? That's Isn't beautiful, that? Charles. Thank you for that. And you know how we could, how Germany Cricket knew this? How? Because crickets were the instrument by which one of our dreams when I was a child came true. Hmm. You see... When I was a boy, we lived in Hollywood. And before that, in New York, and in both places, one of the great horrors of our lives were the uh, minuscule little brown creatures called cockroaches. Okay. Roaches were really disgusting. But my dad discovered something interesting. Okay. We, there we were besieged in that old 1920s building by cockroaches. Every time he lifted something, little buggers came running around. What to do? Well, my dad did some research. Do you know what crickets love to eat most of anything? What? Roach eggs. And so dad got four or five or six of them from a pet shop and released them in the house. And you know what happened? What? No more roaches. We did have the sweet sound of crickets, but the roaches were gone. And so you see, through the medium of crickets, our dream of living in a roach-free environment came true. Without chemicals, pesticides, DDT, or other environmentally harmful substances. It was a natural, organic way of getting rid of our unwanted guests. But then you got different unwanted guests. We like the crickets. <laughs> okay. No, besides, I mean, they uh, are particular crickets. Actually, they were they were kind of. Uh, I mean, they were grateful for the chance. They needed a new gig. After Buddy Holly died, they just didn't have anywhere to go. Yeah, Buddy Holly and the crickets. Well, yeah. What do you think happened to the crickets after he died? They hired out as uh, roach exterminators. All right, let me ask you a question. So yes. you, one of them went to Times Square, the cricket in Times Square. You are fond of using the metaphor of um, comparing politicians to sort of the insects that scatter when you uh, lift up a rock, right? Yeah. Um, so politicians, equivalent of cockroaches, et cetera, et cetera. So let me ask you this. What would be the equivalent of of crickets, but for politicians. <laughs> monarchist, re monarchist revolution. What? What did you say? Monarchist revolutionaries. <laughs> wow. Well, actually, that's actually pretty close. Uh, no more roaches. Bye-bye. The king's back. We don't need you anymore. Wow. You didn't know about crickets from monarchists, did you? I did not know that. Whoa, whoa, you thought Jiminy Cricket was some sort of socialist? Look at the way the man dresses, for heaven's sake. Obviously an aristocrat of some kind. <sighs> what is wrong? You seem confused. All right, um... Is All right, let me ask you. Let me ask you this: since we're on the topic of Disney, as what often is, uh, as you know, as you wish upon a star is sort of the national anthem of Disneyland. When you wish upon a star, 
And when you go to Disneyland, you will hear you'll hear it playing in Fantasyland incessantly. So, what was your first Disney film that you remember? And you don't have to remember it the whole way through, just vaguely conscious of seeing it. I mean, in the theater or um... either, either. I think I um, the first one I saw in the theater was Little Mermaid, mm. oh, which was actually my my favorite Disney movie because the villain is so evil. I thought it was like one of the most evil villains. Ursula is like, ooh, and I'm I love the sea and ocean, and so and Sebastian the crab is really cute, um, but uh. The first one I remember, I don't, I don't know if it works like that. Um, I really like the Robin Hood one and the Sword in the Stone one were some of my perhaps earliest. I don't know if they are the the earliest, but those two uh, were Oof. pretty good. The Sword in the Stone is the first movie I remember seeing in the, in the theater. Wow! But it came out in nineteen sixty three. Hmm. All I remembered for, for years was the opening song, uh, which stuck in my head. But then, uh, 10 years later, in 1973, it came out again, and I saw it again, and yeah. saw the rest of it. And I remembered it to this day. It It's really really sad seeing Disney turn into such a uh, bizarre setup. Although I did like their, uh, believe it or not, their Winnie the Pooh a picture they made a year or so ago or two years ago uh i didn't see that one is that's a live action one again that's the um is that on the the author of winnie the pooh yeah yeah uh, and also uh, another one they did i liked was uh the mary poppins sequel oh yeah my mom said that was okay it um, was okay I mean, it wasn't as good as the original, but you yeah. could. However, it had one actor from the original. I haven't seen it, but I'll just straight up guess Dick Van Dyke because he's immortal. Of course, he's, yeah, immortal. he's just gonna live forever. Um, you, you heard he's uh, you heard he's already booked in Vegas through uh, twenty fifty eight. Wow! The deathless Dick Van Dyke. Hey, but I, I'm good with it. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the man can live forever. I'd be happy. Uh, <laughs> you know, if he keeps going, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, no memes we, today. Oh, you're just an old Mimi. Yes, I am an old Mimi. Uh, so, <laughs> questions. Are you ready for the questions, Charles? Oh, boy, the questions. You know... <sighs> I'm tired. Tired of being admired. <laughs> yes. Let's face it. I'm tired. It's a rough life being a superstar. Well, that's for sure. Ask your friend Oswald. Ah, yes. Good old Oswald. He's in a bad way right now. Why is that? Shortage of polyester. Okay. <laughs> Why? I'm just telling you. It's very if if you're if you're dedicated to wearing nothing but polyester, these days the shortages of the polyester fields, uh, it's it's difficult. All right, all right. First question is from Patrick. <laughs> you don't want to talk about polyester fields. I don't want to talk about polyester fields. That's correct. Did I thought you liked her? Wow, Charles. What? You went to school with it, didn't you? No, I did. First grade, polyester fields. Yeah, I know. But... You didn't go to school with it? No, I didn't. No, no, no prom date or anything. No. <laughs> you seem vaguely disturbed. That I brought even brought her up. Is was there something going on there I didn't know about? 
<laughs> no, Charles, there wasn't anything going on there you didn't know about. Oh, so I knew all about it, did I? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember anything this is, about it. This is intolerable. All right. When, when did you meet this one? <laughs> I, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> All right, fine. Be that way. We'll for for the sake of gallantry, we'll pretend nothing ever happened. Okay, good. And she can keep her reputation intact. Perfect. All right. Uh, Patrick says, greetings to Don Vincenzo and the unitive Charles Coulomb. Ooh. Yes. We're on brand See. today. Uh, could Mr. Coulomb uh, perhaps try to rank his five favorite monarchical couples in the rich royal history of Christendom? I wouldn't envy the task of ranking Blessed Charles and Zeta versus Isabel and Ferdinand, but that's why Charles gets the big bucks and I don't. If he's able to do this, may he please do so. Hmm. I can't do it. Yeah. And top is Carl and Zeta, because they both on their way to sainthood, which is not true for number two, Isabella and Ferdinand, because Isabella is, Ferdinand is not. Uh, after that, I would say Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, Charles I and Henriette Marie, and let's see, that's four. So, Nicholas and Alexandra. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. Is um, what, what was the second couple again? Uh, the second couple was Ferdinand and Isabella. Okay, and the third was um, Marie Antoinette Marie... and Louis and Louis Sixteenth. Is there a cause for them? Uh no. Well, there have been attempts. Uh, the problem is that for the church to canonize Louis XVI. And it's interesting, the Pope at the time he was murdered said that he was convinced he was a martyr. But attempts to open up a cause of beatification have been repulsed on political reasons. Yeah, Because for the Pope, for the Church to, to beatify Louis XVI would be to admit, well, to condemn the revolution yeah. in toto. Yeah. And would you bear in mind that every French government since 1830 has based itself on the revolution? That would be kind of a tough order in political. However, uh, the cause of Louis XVI's sister was recently introduced, Madame Boyan, Elizabeth, mm. who was murdered by the revolutionaries as well. Hmm. Yeah. Um, when I think of those in this context, and you're talking about sainthood, uh, that reminds me of Solange Hertz in... Uh, I forgot where she talks about it. I think it might be in her book, On the Contrary, uh, but I could be wrong. Um, but she does one of these things uh, that I like a lot, where she jumps between the characterization that America puts on um, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette, and then their writings, their letters. Yeah. Which was so different. And it makes, I think it was Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. They had such poison. They had so much venom directed toward the, uh, that couple. And then to, ha to see their words and their writing, and, which were quite saintly, uh, I must say. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, that changes your worldview of things. When you yeah, say that, it, you know what I mean? It, like, yeah, I do. It changes your view of Jefferson and Franklin. It absolutely. Yeah. And it causes you to look at, at the world, and especially the founding of America in a different manner. Um, it's true. So anyhow, just a shout out, just a, just a normal, not a shameless plug, not a shameless plug. We're just, you know, we're just highlighting books that are important, which we just happen to publish. That's all. And which, uh, if you order several of them, uh, so that your total your order total is more than twenty five dollars, you get yeah. free shipping and handling. Yeah. Uh, no CODs. Very sorry about that. Void were prohibited. Yeah. Operators are standing by. Be the first time you're blocked to have one. Yeah. Not an actor. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Batteries not included. Some assembly <laughs> required. <laughs> Again, passing the savings on to you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Act 
now. <laughs> Heck no. <laughs> Uh, oh gosh, ladies and gentlemen, too much fun. It's been a All while. Right. That felt good. Yeah, we it did. It did. It felt very, very good. All right. Um. So. All right. So we finished that one. Uh. Next question is from Cal, who says, "Salutations to the Baron of Bookbinding, Don Vincenzo." That's and you. Our, yeah, and our learned legitimist Charles Coulomb. C'est moi. It's you. Lately, I have been thinking about the church in North Africa prior to the arrival of Islam in the region. While I have seen pre-Islamic Europe and the Near East discussed far more in historical circles, it seems that North African Christianity is brought up far less frequently. Uh, Given that this region was once part of the Roman Empire's dominion, would Charles please summarize the history of Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy in pre-Islamic North Africa and its impact on the culture thereof? Thank you both, and most importantly, Viva Nueva Jersey. Si, Viva Nueva Jersey. Arriba, arriba. Hoboken. Hohokus. Cape May. Captain. What? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Jersey, waiting to be discovered. <laughs> They should run commercials with that tag. They should. Uh, New Jersey, yours to embrace. You like Jersey, Atlantic City. Yeah, I do. I actually do like Atlantic City. The boardwalk. On the boardwalk yeah. in Atlantic City. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, well, I I really can't put it out over here. I should put my boater on and uh, sing that song. Wait till the summertime. Okay. There's nothing quite like walking the boardwalk in Atlantic City wearing a straw boater on your head. I, I can see that. Yeah, that's that's that would be pretty cool. Seal sucker suit, straw boater, bow tie. Well, I made the big time. Here I am in Atlantic City. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you something. They told me my act would never get out of Jersey. It never got into Jersey. You see, that's what happened. <laughs> I remember it was autumn of 1928 when I first went into vaudeville. Oh, well, never mind. Anyway, moving along. Uh, could you repeat the question? No, no, no. I remember what it was. Uh, well, if... let's do our geography first. Okay. All right. Um, in Roman times, starting from east to west, uh, you had Egypt, of course. Uh, immediately west of Egypt, now part of Libya, is Cyrenaica. Uh, and then from Cyrenaica west to the middle, more or less, of what's now Algeria, was Numidia. Uh, but northern Tunisia was the actual province of Africa. And that its capital was Carthage. And then uh, Morocco and western uh, Algeria was Mauritania. Well, uh, uh, no, St. Mark set up the Patriarchate of uh, Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, and that was eastern Byzantine, as it were. But... Uh, Carthage was really the ecclesiastical center of Western North Africa, which was Latin. And the, Latin, the mass was in Latin very early on. It was very tightly connected to Rome. St. Augustine came from there. Um, and the people were a combination of Berber, Phoenician, and Roman. So um, the, uh, when the Roman Empire fell, uh, the Vandals took over North Africa, well, out, outside of Egypt, which stayed in Byzantine Roman hands. Uh, and then, in the uh, starting in the 600s, you had a, you had the Monophysite schism in Egypt, which led to the formation of the Coptic Church. So, you know, the Coptic Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox of Alexandria. Uh, in the West, Latin-speaking, I mean, they spoke Berber, they still spoke Punic, 
but Latin was Augustine's uh, first language, uh, or at least one of them. Uh, but the uh, in the 500s, Justinian reconquered North Africa for Byzantine Rome and southern Spain and, and Italy. And they held on to North Africa, the Byzantines, until in the, uh, in the 600s, the uh, Muslims invaded Egypt. In the 700s, late 600s, early 700s, they invaded North Africa and took over from the Byzantines. Um, and from North Africa, of course, they invaded Spain. Well, slowly but surely, the Christian North Africans were uh, converted to Islam. Although as late as the 1200s, there were still three dioceses of native Christians there. And there was still a Latin dialect spoken in Tunisia uh, that late. But gradually that was all snuffed. Until the, uh, the French, the Spanish, the Italians, the British recolonized uh, North Africa in the 19th century, that the faith flourished there again. But as an interesting byproduct, the only place where the, native, where the North African natives were evangelized to any degree uh, was by the French in uh, what's called Kabylia. Uh, and there are 500 to 1,000 to this day Catholic Kabyles. And they're very, they were very, very much taken with the figure of St. Augustine, and still are. So amongst the few Catholic, Native Catholic North Africans today, St. Augustine is very much their patron. Hmm. Okay. The, um, didn't, didn't the Franciscans make a lot of attempts in North Africa? They, they sure did, uh, which did not go very well. Uh, they got a lot of martyrs out of the deal, but that was about it. Yeah, I, I came across that in... Uh one of the biographies for St. Francis, I had read three different biographies of him, and one of them, it's kind of funny. Uh, so uh, actually, reading St. Anthony's bi uh, bio too, he wanted to go to North Africa to get martyred. Yeah. And it was very humiliating because he got sick, and then he got shipped back really quickly. Yeah. Um, and so uh, so St. Anthony, despite wanting to get martyred down there, didn't. And the same is true for St. Francis, yeah. where he was way too likable to be martyred. They wouldn't, he, he couldn't they get wouldn't himself martyred. <laughs> he couldn't get himself martyred. You, couldn't get, you can't even get yourself martyred in this town. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is. It's, what kind of a dump is it's it? It's really but ironic. Yeah. It, it's true. But blessed Raymond Lull, he was martyred oh. for trying to convert. Interesting. Uh, now, the other thing that happened was that when the, uh, the French uh, and the others conquered North Africa, they uh, settled. You know, they had, they brought over colonists who built vineyards and churches and all that sort of thing. But after independence, they all had to leave, or almost all. Mm. Which is a real terrible thing. Uh, something like a million Frenchmen had to leave Algeria in two weeks in 1962. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Uh, all right. A question from Daniel who says, Dear Vincent, as a native of St. Louis, I'm very much interested in all of the provinces of France. Will you please ask Charles to give a history of his favorite French provinces? All right. Absolutely, Daniel. Charles, please give. Will you give a history of your favorite French uh, provinces? No. Yes, I will. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of them, but I will confine myself to <laughs> two of them. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I mean, because there are a lot of them. Auvergne, Provence, uh, Gascogne, Poitou. I, I mean, they're wonderful. But my two favorites are Normandie and uh, Bretagne. Uh, Normandie, uh, my family come from which is one reason why I've got the funny light coloring I've got. It's, 
not because I'm white, it's because I'm Norman. But basically, the uh, uh, in the 900s, the uh, Norsemen kept harassing the French and raiding and burning like they did in all sorts of other places. So basically, uh, basically what happened was that the king of France gave the, these Vikings, led by a guy called Rollo, Normandy, in return for their leaving everybody else alone and for their converting, which they did. But they didn't bring many women with them, so within five generations, they were French. But as this mixed bunch of Normans had a huge influence on world history, uh, a group of them went down to southern Italy, which at the time was divided. Sicily was in Muslim hands. Apulia belonged to the Byzantines. And it was, it was all a mess. So they conquered the whole lot and created what would later be the kingdom of the two Sicilies. And that's why you'll find blonde people in southern Italy and Sicily, and people don't understand why. Well, it's because there are a lot of Norman descendants down there. The other and more famous was the civilizing mission of 1066, where they crossed the English Channel to help the English become more completely themselves. Okay, Charles. And so they did. Uh, but they also uh, conquered and left descendants uh, in parts of Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And interestingly enough, in Ireland, the Normans there often took the name uh, in emulation of the Gaelic custom, where they had names, the family names like O'Neill or O'Connor, son of Neil, son of Connor. The Normans did the same thing, only they used their own language. So you have names like Fitzroy and Fitz Davis. Well, Fitz is the French fils, son. So Fitzgerald is son of Gerald. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So cool. that's that's a little bit of Norman uh, stuff, and then of course later on, uh, they were eventually detached. All, almost all the Duchy of Normandy reverted to the French crown. The only part that didn't are what we call today the Channel Islands, uh, Jersey and Guernsey. But the Queen is not Queen of England in the Channel Islands. She's the Duke of Normandy. And they toast her as Elizabeth R. Duke. She changes gender when she goes down there. It's it's very advanced concept. So the uh, uh, the Normans, however, continued under the French. Uh, and during the French Revolution, Normandy was the center of resistance to the revolution, the so-called Chouanerie. Now, Brittany, Britannia, next door, uh, also a very fascinating place because when the Anglo-Saxons were invading England, they pushed the Britons ever further west into Strathclyde, Cumbria, Wales, and Cornwall. But a lot of them fled completely and went to Brittany, Little Britain, Britannia. And it is with Cornwall, Wales, the Isle of Man, Scotland, and Ireland, one of the six Celtic nations of Europe with their own language which, of course, has been continually under attack, but there it is. Uh, very conservative, still very Catholic, uh, really an enchanted place. And again, during the French Revolution, a hotbed of uh, anti-revolutionary activity. So hmm. those are two of my favorite French provinces. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm looking at them on the map. So there, it's basically the north... Western West. France, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the uh, area of France that is as far away from Italy as possible. Okay. Do, do you well, hear yourself? Yeah, I hear myself, yeah. All right, you know the best part of Italy? <laughs> Look it up. Val d'Aosta. V-A-L, D apostrophe, a-O-S-T-A. And then you tell me why it's the best part of Italy. A-S-T-A? A-O-S-T-A. What? 
it's like right in between Switzerland, France, and Italy. Wait. It's not. <laughs> wow. You see, it's the best part of Italy. <sighs> what? You sound sad. You sound so sad today. Why? It's very beautiful. Yes, it is. Okay. All right, it's Charles. It's extremely <laughs> lovely. And what? what's the language they speak there out of curiosity? Yes? I don't want to talk about this place. What, what, what's wrong with it? <sighs> okay. Oh, All right. you can tell me. What do you think about it? What, what, what language do they speak there? Um, I would assume France. Or French. Oh, how yeah. strange. You're absolutely right. Isn't that bizarre? But if it makes you feel better. The reason why they speak French is that they're directly south of the French-speaking part of Switzerland. Okay. La Suisse Romande, we call it. Very now, mind you, there's the French-speaking part of Belgium, which is called Wallonie. All right. Okay, you happy then, that you got that in? You, you feel good about yourself? Well, no, I just point out there's the Italian-speaking part of, uh, of the United States, they, which they call New Jersey. All right, uh, question from Nicholas. Hello, gentlemen. I was wondering if Charles could talk about the Spanish Civil War for a little bit. It's a period of hi in history that I honestly don't know much about, and I was hoping that Charles could discuss some of the major events, some smaller events, or rather interesting stories from the conflict. Recommend any good books on the subject. Of course, firstly, with the permission of His Grace, the Duke of Tumblerford upon Patreon. Hmm. You have my permission, Charles. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the Spanish Civil War was a fascinating time. Basically, uh, Spain had been undergoing a period of increasing internal conflict, which culminated in the uh, uh, departure of the king in 1931. The establishment of the Second Republic, which became increasingly unstable and leftist and communist. And the churches were being attacked, nuns being raped, you know, the usual. So the army uh, under Francisco Franco uh, declared an end to it, and the result was the Civil War. And the, uh, the, uh, Nationalists, as Franco's people were called, were backed by the Germans, the Italians, uh, and every conservative in Europe and America. The loyalists, as the adherents of the uh, overthrown government were called, were backed by the Soviets and communists everywhere. Uh, and this went on for three years until the loyalists were defeated. It was interesting, uh, Franco's side was interesting because he was one of the very, very few historic figures who were ever able to successfully unite the right because he united the Carlists who supported the, the rightful family, the Alfonsinos who were the partisans of the last king, uh, the Falangists who were <sighs> they weren't fascists, but they were certainly modern right people uh, and various other groups. He pulled them all together effectively by promising everybody everything and defeated the uh, the communists. And then he kept in power himself. The best book to read about it is by Warren Carroll. It's called The Last Crusade, 1936, Spain, 1936. I recommend it very highly. It was a fascinating time. Um, truly fascinating. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, that book is out of print. It's a hard book to get. Um, but yeah. Anyhow. All right. Uh, what do we have next? We have, um, last question for today from Anita. Anita. 
who says, Happy Epiphany Tide, gentlemen. Question for Charles. I have been watching with alarm the way things have been going in Australia the last two years. Really four or five years if you include what happened to Cardinal Pell. Clearly, I am missing something because Australia is not a place I would have expected to rapidly devolve into a prison state. Yet this moment must have been a long time in preparation. What is it in Australia's history and culture that has set it up for this precipitous decline? Could the United States soon end up in the same boat? I think a big reason we are not there already is because so many of us have guns. Thank you, God bless, and a Hail Mary said for you and yours. Well, you know, it's, it's a funny thing. You see the same thing in Canada and New Zealand. Uh, these are the three countries that were always frontier countries. You know, they were, they were big on freedom and on uh, you could go out and do whatever you wanted. And now all three of them are, are like caricatures of themselves. Uh, I think there are probably several different things at work here. Uh, I, I don't like getting too Jungian. But Jung did have one idea that I've always believed to be quite true, and that was what he called the law of opposites, hmm. which is that whatever people yap about the most, they're the opposite of that. So when someone's always talking about freedom and, and this and that, they're usually kind of conformists. And when people are talking about order and discipline and so on, uh, they're usually sort of anarchists. <laughs> and so it goes. Uh I think that with Australia, uh, too, and you and you see this in in Anglo Canada and New Zealand. I think for the same reason, uh, there was a great crisis of identity before. I mean, these countries were basically part of the empire, and their ethos was Britain in North America, Britain in the South Seas. One, uh, you know, one, uh, one king, one flag, one empire. But the uh, generation of '68, the way they manifested themselves in those countries, was to try to destroy their national traditions and remake them in this sort of weird new style Australian, new style New Zealand, or new style Canadian, or what uh, the worthless man uh, Tony Blair called in Britain Cool Britannia. Which, when I heard that, my first thought was, you mean Fool Britannia? But I think that the way that the culture, the, the national identity had been chipped away at continually over the past 50 years was a partial, the whole concept of the, uh, you know, uh, matehood and uh, the free swagger and uh, all that kind of stuff. It just, it's all gone. What's the, the free uh, swagger? Well, you know what a swagman is. Once the jolly swagman camped by a billabong under the shade of a coolabar tree. That's a terrible Australian accent. <laughs> I, I've never been able to do it, so I'm not going to try but basically, a swagman was a, a free ranger. You know, he'd go all over the country hunting, uh, you know, living off the land. Uh, like Crocodile around. Dundee. Like Crocodile Dundee. And they were called swagmen or swaggers. And they were the image of freedom, you know. Uh, and mind you, Lest you, lest you think it was just Australians. They had uh, swagmen in New Zealand, too. Uh, oh, uh, the, uh, you know, Waltzing Matilda is the, uh, the song, the folk song for Australia. Well, the one for New Zealand, the equivalent, is a song called Black Billy T. Uh, <laughs> And it's got a verse in it. Because, and you notice, it shows you the English influence. Uh, shows you the English influence in both countries. Where our cowboys would drink coffee. You know, we, you always see them in the drinking yeah. rot get coffee around <laughs> campfire. Uh, in Australia and New Zealand, it was tea. 
tea boiled in a billy, which would be some metal vessel made of whatever kind of scrap or crap they put together out of the campfire. And so the uh, Black Billy Tea had the wonderful uh, <laughs> the wonderful chorus, Black Billy Tea, boys, black as it can be. Black Billy Tea is the stuff for me. Brew it in a billy, brew it in a pot. Just throw in a handful, pour it while it's hot. Drink it from a cup, boys, drink it from a tin. Turn the bottom up, boys, and fill her up again. <laughs> Mouth organ Jack and John the Baptist, too. All the old time swaggers, they knew how to brew. Way down in a coal mine or diving on a drive. Black Billy T keeps a man alive. <laughs> the, uh, there's, there's one line in there. Uh, what is it? Uh, Black Billy T, black as Stockholm tar. <laughs> So the uh, that that uh, the whole bush ranger thing that was the the mystique like the cowboy was for America. Hmm. That was the mystique in Australia, and it's 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 all gone. You remember they had a shooting incident there some few years ago, uh, and that resulted in the, in the confiscation of most guns. So. I don't, I don't know that that really is a part of it as our questioner says, but it happened. And, you know, there's just been throughout the Anglosphere a whammyfication, a, uh, a wienerization of everything. You have it in America, too. You know, everything is just so, ooh, ooh, we're so gender fluid. And so are Gene Willikers. I don't know. It's just so. Yeah. Yeah, we're Weenie Central. I remember that was one of the names of one of our first uh, episodes, Weenie Central, as you Weenie say. Weenie Central, I, I do. Well, in, in place, I mean, you, you know, you've got the, uh, instead of the uh, the north the northwest frontier man in, uh, in Canada, the cowboy in the States, the swagman in Australia, New Zealand, you know, the, the, the ranger on the Cape and Natal. Instead of all those guys, you've got the Weenie. And the weenie, he sits in control, and he gets to make other decisions for everybody, and they have to take it because if they don't, they'll be punished. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sick of weenieism, and, I, and you know, if you think about it, one of the not the only, the only contributing factor, but one of the contributing factors to the nannying of COVID is weenieism. I mean, what, and ladies, don't take this the wrong way, but what is the womanly reaction to anything? The motherly reaction. Get everything, you know, tack everything up, get very comfy, cozy, and just you know, ride out the storm. Which, mind you, there's certainly a place to that. I mean, the, the male impulse left by itself, we'd all gotten killed. So I'm not, I'm not <laughs> you know, I, yeah. but there's, there's got to be a balance, you see. Yeah. The problem in society today, in the English speaking world, the West in general, is that we're, we've been totally weenified. We're all women. Uh, in some other day, some other time, it may be we'll have the opposite problem. You know, and then we'll have to say, you know, guys, <laughs> it's really time to come in out of the cold right now. This is really a little watch. No, I am Viking. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I got that. But these are meat-eating mutant crickets that are on their way. And I, I really, I really would go inside right now. No, I am ready to test my manhood. Yeah, yeah, I understand. That's great, pal. But see, that isn't our current problem right now. We don't have leaders like that. We have little weenie leaders. It, it's so I think that's part of it. The law of opposites taking its revenge, and also don't forget too that uh, Christianity uh, and Catholicism in particular is really withered in the antipodes. Uh, I mean, as the Pell Cardinal showed, as the Pell uh, trial showed. Uh, mind you, there is there are rumors 
that uh, money went from uh, Cardinal uh, Bechu to uh, or someone else to Australia to uh, help build up the bribery down there. I don't know if that's true. I suppose I'd have to have a grinder account and talk directly to someone involved. What? We're talking about the Vatican. Show sure respect. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Anyhow, could you, see, could you not? Why did you bring up Grinder anyway? I wasn't thinking. We've gone through this whole show without mentioning Grinder once, and look what happens. Honestly. Anyhow, uh, but it, it really. It's a combination of those things. And it, it's sad to watch because I'll be honest with you, I've been to Australia. I love the country. It's a bit whacked. But, you know, people who walk upside down all the time, you've got to expect they'll have issues. They walk upside down all the time? Well, yeah, because they're on the other side of the world. Yeah. Okay. That's so true. they walk upside down. Yeah. See? Yeah. But seriously speaking, though, I often think, you, you know, it's, it's not well known today, but there's a whole genre of Victorian era ghost stories from Australia. 19th century and all that. There's a big, big flourishing ghost story literature. And it, it, it kind of makes sense because you've got to bear in mind, you've got all these British people going to the other side of the world where the stars are different. And I got to tell you, that for me was always the weirdest thing being down there. The stars are different? Oh, yeah. It's on the other side of the world. And so Orion is upside down. And they have the big Southern Cross, which is a constellation that you can't see in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it's on, it's huge. It's, uh, I mean, that's why it's on the Australian and New Zealand flags. It's, it's hard to miss when you get out of the night sky. Hmm. Uh, the seasons are reversed. You know, there's uh, Christmas down there is the middle of summer. Yeah. Uh, and the animals are bizarre compared to European animals. And the aboriginals were bizarre. Even the Maoris were a lot easier to understand in uh, New Zealand. But the, the, the aboriginals, were this whole dream type thing. So they find themselves in the midst of this bizarre world where every animal is seemingly out to kill you. And not surprisingly, their literature uh, produced a lot of ghost stories. I see. Okay, I thought you were talking about real life ghost stories, like Sean Leslie's no, no, no. book. Okay. No, no, I'm talking about I'm talking about the the sort of weird turn that Australian literature took early on in the uh, in the history of the country. Hmm. And of course, the one of the first poems ever to come out of Australia has a wonderful line in it, which now that I'm living over here, it often hits me. True patriots all, for be it understood. We left our country for our country's good. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that neat? That's cu that's cute. Uh, so, um, what about her other question? Could the United States soon end up in the same boat? Well, it might be a little bit harder. For one thing, the federal system in Australia has been eroded for a long, long time. One of the biggest uh, things that damaged it was the ruling by the Australian Supreme Court, I think as early as the 1930s, maybe, that all taxes had to be collected by the federal government and distributed to the states by the feds. Well, that's a major thing right there. Uh, so since Federation in 1901, the states have been, the position of the states has been steadily eroded, which interestingly is the opposite of Canada, where since Confederation in 1867, the provinces have gotten stronger and stronger. And one of the ironic things about this is that although Canadian provinces are stronger than Australian states, now they weren't at the beginning so as a result the uh you have the governor general in canada who represents the queen 
but the lieutenant governors in each of the Canadian provinces, they represent the queen, but constitutionally they represent the governor general. But in Australia, the state governors represent the queen and have nothing to do with the governor general in Canberra because they're a remnant of the time when each of the Australian states was a separate colony. Hmm. So that uh, it's interesting that the on paper, the uh, the two countries are the opposite of what they are in reality. Anyhow, um, could the United States go that way? Well, there's a lot of resistance here. You know, we have 50 states for one thing. And they all have very, very different uh, motives. I mean, the uh, in uh, Texas, Oklahoma, and I think Florida, the heads of the respective National Guards have told the government that they're not going to enforce vaccination on National Guard uh, uh, people, and their governors have backed them up. Well, you constitutionally you'd be in a, a weird position anywhere else to do that. It, it seems like there's there's something in the national character that it sort of protects us compared to Australia because the way you say it, it's like, well, well, they just scooped up everyone's guns. Where well, there's, something, there's something in America's national character where there, there ain't no way you're doing that. There's no way. That's well, not no, going to happen. Uh, because of, of three reasons, you know, we were, we were born in a revolution, yeah. uh, fought, fought a civil war and had this huge frontier that was literally tamed. Yeah. So, it formed our national character as much as anything else has. Uh, and also, don't forget, the people who came to the United States, for the most part, were people who either weren't wanted elsewhere or couldn't make it elsewhere. Uh, so you've got, you know, we're, we're malcontents and the descendants of malcontents. And that, that has good, good elements and it has bad elements. You know, uh, when you're facing tyranny, uh, it's great. <laughs> when you're trying to do something for the common good, it's crap. Yeah. So uh, the the problem with being in a fallen world is that nothing is perfect. Yeah, it's very true. As my late father used to say, it's your own fault for coming to a fallen world. Next time, go to an unfallen one and you won't have this problem. And I've, I've borne that in mind. I've, you know, I've often told, whenever I go back to Roswell, I've told the people at the mothership that I, I'm, I'm thinking my, my usefulness here is coming to an end, and it's time for me to go home. But so far, they've said no. You've, you've still got more work to do, so they're keeping me here for now. Hmm. But I'm ready to go. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, when I made my last report, I said, I think it's I think it's time for us just all to go back and give up the Earth Project entirely. But uh, you know, Commander Morgan said no, no. So yeah, he's a he's a stick in the mud. He has always has been. You know, I remember when we first discovered this system what eight hundred years ago, uh, Earth years. Uh, yeah, I didn't think there was much uh, much potential here, but he said, "Look, orders are orders." You know, and it's true. If it were left to me, we'd all be back home in the flesh pots of Wagaya. Oh, to see <laughs> once again the three moons over the beautiful hydrogen sulfide seas. Oh, well. What? Yeah. All right, okay. Charles. Are you, are you okay? <laughs> You seem a little confused. A little. Polyester uh, fields forever. Polyester fields forever. Great. That, was that a Beatles song? That's Strawberry Fields. Are you sure? I am sure. Was that Polyester's sister? Strawberry Fields? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think she was two grades behind her, wasn't she? At, uh, <laughs> Bishop Amat. <laughs> They were the only girls at Bishop Vermont. It was a very strange setup. 
All right, Charles, we've reached the end. Any closing thoughts? Oh, I've got lots of closing thoughts. For starters, in real time, ladies and gentlemen, this is the 22nd of January. Uh, Yesterday was the anniversary of the murder of Louis XVI. Coming up on the 28th is the Feast of Blessed Charlemagne, my name day. And you know, I just found out today, the King of Sweden celebrates it as his name day, too. So it's a flag day in Sweden. So all you Swedes out there, you better celebrate Blessed Charlemagne's Day, or you hate your king and your country. So there, Swedes, take that. <laughs> uh, the the, uh, the uh, uh, Two days later, January the 30th, is the day upon which uh, King Charles I was murdered by Cromwell. It's also the days when Dom Guéranger, Venerable Dom Guéranger, and Blessed Dom Columba Martyr, Marmion died. So it's their feast days as well. January 31st was the death day of Bonnie Prince Charlie. And then, then comes the Feast of St. Bridget, February the 1st and Candlemas Eve. And then, ladies and gentlemen, on February the 2nd, Christmas. No, I can't bring myself to say it. I won't. I don't want Christmas to leave. Stop it! I don't want Christmas to leave. I need Christmas to stay. I still have my Christmas tree up, but I think we're taking it down today. Oh, yeah? Look. (sighs) Look. You see, I've got my crush up and all the Christmas tree cards, all the Christmas cards. There you go. The tree had to be defenestrated, but it's still Christmas here. And I, I, I need a little Christmas right this very minute. <sighs> I do. Do you need Christmas? I need Christmas. Well, so do we all. However... Remember that Mardi Gras lies ahead and then Lent and all sorts of good stuff. And who knows what the what the uh, coming months bring. They should be fairly exciting as the COVID uh, narrative collapses. I think so. I'm pretty excited. Um... My uh, brother and sister-in-law just came back from driving out to Oklahoma. And everywhere they went, people weren't wearing masks. It was terrible. Hmm. Wow, that's... It's uh... a <laughs> yeah. It's... I I tell you what though. I over here in California, you know what the saddest thing I, I I've ever seen. It's just I can't stand it. My biggest pet peeve right now is when I'm on the freeway. Yes. When I... and you're driving to work, right? Everyone's alone in their car. Wearing masks. Wearing masks. <laughs> what the hell are you doing? Well, they might get infected. By what? Uh, it's in the air. Uh, I just... Don't uh, you know people love certain people? Remember what I said about the law of opposites? SoCal is a place where people like to pretend to be very independent in themselves and so on. Why not? It, it, it just makes me sad. It, it makes me sad. I was frustrated initially, but now it's just like... These people are encased in a prison of fear. Bondage and submission, dominance and obedience. Yeah. At any rate, here at Weenie Central, we feel, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Weenie Central revisited. You've, you've, wait a minute. Wait, let, let's slow down a second. Is Austria Weenie Central? Is that what you're saying now? I would say that our, our parliament, our government are Weenie Central. <laughs> oh, Not the country. Wow. The country is great. I mean, all of the all of the uh, the polls show that this is wildly unpopular. The chief of the police union asked the government not to do this. You know, but they're they're but just going to do it. It's a democracy, though, right? So, uh, yeah, it's that... a democracy, like every other. <laughs> it's as much a democracy as Australia or the United States. <laughs> all right. Um... All right, that'll do it for this episode. Remember, everyone, if it's Monday, it's off the menu. Yeah, but the so you say may be your own. Ooh.
So there. God bless you all, gang. We'll see you next week.